Richard Kraft Ebbing, Havelock Ellis and Sigmund Freud were the leaders of a new breed of scientists called sexologists who devoted themselves to the study of human sexual behaviour. It was these men who began the process of discovering the homosexual. They had begun their work in the late 19th century, before the men who made up the gay scene of the 30s were even born. But their writings were to remain confined to intellectual circles for many years. At the time they wrote, science was just beginning to view human behaviour in a wholly new way, dividing people into different types, normal and abnormal, each with their own distinct personalities and even physical characteristics. The sexologists did the same for sex, and so people who preferred their own sex became homosexuals. Before the 19th century, homosexual activities, homosexual practices existed, but the notion that there was such a person as the homosexual didn't exist. This is a relatively recent notion and is no older than about a hundred years. What was punished was certain forms of homosexual activities, usually sodomy, in fact. But sodomy was a characteristic of, in a sense, of all sinful people. It, it wasn't a characteristic of a particular type of person. Whereas, increasingly, from the end of the 19th century, homosexuality is seen as the characteristic of a particular species, the species of the homosexual. What matters to the sexologists in the late 19th century, and in this century, in fact, is an attempt to define what's normal and what's abnormal. Now, this notion of normality is very much related to the much sharper definitions of masculinity and femininity in the course of the 19th century, and the, the bond that brings masculinity and femininity together, heterosexuality. And the homosexual, the description of the homosexual, is an attempt to fit um, a certain group of people into this notion that there are sharp divisions between male and female. And the only way you can do that in terms of social science is to say that certain people are somehow intermediate between real men and real women. It was from the precursors of men like Gifford and his friends that the sexologists got most of their ideas about homosexuals. When they saw that effeminate sisters had sex with masculine trade, they concluded there must be two sorts of homosexual, and they called them inverts and perverts. Essentially, the notion of inversion was invented by the sexologists at the end of the 19th century to describe those people they saw as inherently homosexual, people whose homosexuality was inborn, congenital. The notion of perversion was an attempt to explain, a feeble attempt to explain, those people who they saw not as inborn homosexuals, but those who were uh, corrupted into homosexuality, either through inadequate parents or through um, corruption in youth or through bad influences in adulthood. So you get this sort of dichotomous version developing of the real homosexual who has to be pitied and the, the person who is potentially corruptible into it, who has to be protected. The next day, their majesties paid a visit of inspection to the South Bank... Post-war Britain may not have seen the kind of world to be obsessed with homosexuals. Yet it was at this time that the sexologists' ideas were first to take hold of the public consciousness. The exhibition is the central point of the festival, and in the space of some 27 acres, there's plenty of evidence of... British it was a world obsessed with patriotism and with building a new future. It was a world that celebrated the family and the values of ordinary suburban life. Yet it was in this setting that the sexologist's concept of the homosexual, or the invert, was to become known to the broad public for the first time. And this discovery led the public to become obsessed with the idea of the effeminate homosexual corrupting those around him. It all began in 1951, the year Burgess and Maclean fled the country on the eve of their arrest as spies. Much was made of the fact that Burgess, seen here in Moscow with the late Tom Dryberg, was a known homosexual. In many people's minds, the words homosexual and traitor became synonymous. That same year, the Metropolitan Police announced a Clean Up the West End campaign aimed directly against prostitutes and homosexuals. Police arrests for indecency 
multiplied tenfold compared with the 1930s. 1954, Lord Montague and journalist Peter Wildblood are accused of seducing two young airmen. Now gays are corruptors of public morals. The boys are in the forces and also underage. 1957, Ian Harvey, junior minister at the Foreign Office, arrested for indecency with a guardsman. I'd been to a party at one of the embassies and uh, <clears throat> I'd been to the house to vote and then on my way home I thought well I might take a little exercise and I went into the park and uh, I met a young guardsman and he went with me and uh, we went into the darkness of the trees <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately um, we were discovered by the police and one of the park keepers and I was then arrested. Serious papers thought how very terrible it all was that a junior minister of the Foreign Office should be involved in this way. The uh, po popular press of course made the most of it as they would. My political contemporaries obviously had to remember that if they were thought to be friends of a homosexual people would assume immediately that they too were homosexuals and so quite naturally they steered away. But mind you, once this had happened, I tendered my resignation and uh, I didn't go back to the house ever again. Popular papers began offering advice on how to identify one of these dangerous effeminates who was supposedly busy corrupting the state. Anybody with a grain of sense can smell these homos, the Sunday Mirror wrote. For homosexuals like John Alcock, who were in London during those years, it was a terrifying time. They thought that homosexuals were great corruptors because um, the, um, of the amount of publicity that uh, was going on at that particular time with the two uh, cases that I've mentioned and also, of course, Burgess and McLean and, uh, and the spy syndrome and things like that. And uh, they thought that uh, and one or two film stars who at that particular time had fallen from grace and, uh, and so everybody assumed that all homosexuals were alike, that they were corruptors and, uh, and inclined to do harm to people, that, and that we had two heads and, uh, and what have you. Uh, in that period, I even remember that uh, I came home and burnt all my love letters because I was scared shitless. I really was very, very frightened. And this was uh, very, very general. Uh, there was a sort of a witch hunt that was going on names were brandished all over the place and, and what happened. People became very frightened uh, during that period. It's hard to know exactly why society became so hostile to gay men in the 1950s. It's likely that the notion of the homosexual had already begun to filter into popular consciousness even before the Second World War, as the gay scene had expanded and become more visible in the 1930s. Then the war itself, by providing more opportunities for men to have sex with each other, would undoubtedly have spread knowledge of homosexuality even further. And then finally, perhaps, after the war had ended, the need to reassert normality was bound to have meant that exceptions to conventional behaviour would be less easily tolerated. But whether this is the correct explanation or not, the fact that the public had seized on the notion of the homosexual man as an invert who went around perverting other so-called normal men was bound to have important effects on the way that gays were to see themselves from then on and it is from these effects that they are only now emerging. Dudley Cave was one of the generation of gay men who were under attack in the 1950s. They soon found a defence, the sexologists' ideas themselves. Dudley had first come into contact with these notions when he'd been given a book to read by an army doctor. I said, I'm homosexual. I'd only read the word, I'd never heard it. And she said, well, just because you masturbate, it doesn't mean that. And I said, oh, no, with agony, I'm certain. And he stopped me and said, well, look, I'm not an expert in this, but we have an expert in the camp, uh, a sexologist, Dr. Philip Bloom, and I'll arrange you to see him if you like. Well, I saw Philip Bloom. He discussed things with me, my attitudes, my feelings made it quite clear to me that I was homosexual, lent me his copy of Havelock Ellis's Sexual Inversion in Men, and I read that and I recognised myself absolutely clearly on those pages. What Dudley responded to in Ellis's book 
was not the notion of the homosexual as pervert, but as invert, a distinct type of person born different from everyone else. Well, it's years since I've read it, but there were certain things like uh, we were supposed to be attracted to blue, oh, well, never mind, um, and green. Uh, we had the pubic hair tended to be triangular at the straight at the top and not up to the navel as is apparently more heterosexual. In my experience that does seem to be fairly true and that bodily distribution of fat was more in the feminine way than the, um, the male way. Alice, I'm sorry, Alice was therefore thinking of homosexuals as a different type of person, biologically different. Did you share that view? I don't know whether I did or not, but I was prepared to accept what did seem to be like evidence. Certainly my pubic hair ended on a flat line at the top, and I seemed to fit, and I also, blue had been my favorite color, and I did seem to fit in with that. So I was prepared to accept it. I saw no reason why I shouldn't. It didn't, um, didn't come into conflict with any views I had particularly. Many men of that generation sincerely believed that not only they, but all homosexuals, were born that way. Homosexuals are born homosexual. There's no doubt about that in my mind whatsoever. Children do go through a phase uh, during puberty um, of which they pass through and they'll find pleasant or unpleasant and accept or discard uh, as they feel fit. But no, a homosexual is born and he or she can do nothing about it whatsoever. And indeed, why should they want to do anything about it? Uh, when you sort of thought it through, you know, it's quite great to be gay. And um, you'd never have a problem. No, no, no. You wake up, you go to bed at night gay, and you'll wake up in the morning gay, and that's all there is to it. A crop of books were published in the early 60s, all arguing the same thing for it seemed the perfect offence against the public's hostility. If homosexuals were a species apart, born and not made, then they could not possibly corrupt other men to their ways. Homosexuality is not a spreading infectious disease like measles or chickenpox. It is a condition. It isn't like accepting moral rearmament or joining a political party or becoming a Freemason. A man doesn't say, this movement attracts me, I think I'll join. To the true homosexual, sexual relations with the opposite sex are unthinkable, just as the complete heterosexual will have no homosexual urge. John Alcock was amongst many who campaigned for law reform on the grounds that it was illogical to punish a man for something he could not help being. We wanted a, uh, uh, to be recognised and to be taken out of the... Uh, uh, the business of the, of the criminal law. I mean, it's dreadful to, to, uh, to think that you've been uh, branded a criminal all of your life through no particular uh, fault of your own, in, in, indeed, if it's, a, if it's a fault at all, which it is not. It was unfair, and people felt very strongly. And I would uh, like uh, to point out that the majority of people who felt very strongly about the Homosexual Law Reform Society at that particular time were in the main heterosexual people. They were not homosexual people. As a matter of fact, the chairman of the, uh, uh, or I think he was the president of the Homosexual Law Reform Society, was the chief constable of London police. And then we had J.B. Priestley and the Archbishop of Canterbury of that particular time, and adding for the quite a very, very impressive list of people who were determined to get this law changed. Eventually, their view prevailed. Lord Wolfenden had been given the job of investigating homosexuality in the law in the wake of the Montague scandal. The evidence his committee received convinced him of the need for legal change. The chief change we're recommending there is that homosexual behaviour between adult consenting males in private should no longer be a criminal offence. It always has been until now, and, or at any rate, it has for about um, 100 years, and the sense in that we don't see. Uh, that, again, goes back to my general principle that there are some areas of a man's private life which are not the concern of the criminal law, except insofar as they damage 
public order or result in exploitation. The 1967 Sexual Offences Act translated Wolfenden's recommendations into law. Though the bar on sex with men in the forces, or under 21, suggested that the old fears about corruption weren't dead, the gays' view of themselves as born that way had won the day. These legal changes, coupled with the sexual revolution of the late 60s and early 70s, have now produced a new generation of gays whom the men of the 30s would scarcely recognise. These men no longer beg for tolerance. They demand equal rights. Gone are the words queer and pansy. The new slogan is glad to be gay. Gone too is the belief that they are an effeminate halfway sex. For these men, the fact that they are gay doesn't necessarily stop them being masculine. But in one crucial respect, gay men today are still influenced by the theories developed way back at the turn of the century. Perhaps because they've had to cling so hard to the idea that they're different to win tolerance and reform, most gay men still seem to believe that their homosexuality defines them and sets them apart from the rest of the world. Coming out, which is central to the gay movement, means more than just telling people what you do in bed. It's a revelation of your real self. Dudley Cave now works on gay switchboard. He came out by accident when a meeting on homosexuality which he was addressing got advertised in the local paper. And I was out everywhere. I mean, my colleagues read this read this, and they all seemed to be perfectly happy about it. And they probably realised I was gay all the way along, but had kept the pretence. Of course, from then on, I didn't have to lie anymore. I could be totally open. I didn't have to pretend that there might be a girlfriend or whatever. And it's quite extraordinary the difference that it makes throwing away that load of lie and worry that I'd carted round for 50 years, I suppose. I think it's been uh, a major achievement, actually, to um, assert the positive nature of the gay identity. It's made it possible for large numbers of people to come out, to be open about their homosexuality, and to begin to lead stigma-free and relatively um, relaxed lives. It's, it's a crucial development. But what it, in itself, what it does is to... Um, confirm the existence of a fixed minority of people within a wider society, within a normal society. It still plays about with the notion that there are some people who are normal, the majority, and some people who somehow have to be fitted into the, the gaps in this normality. Now Jeff Weeks and others believe that this generation of gay men has one more big change to make, a change that will take the movement back in some ways to the world of 50 years ago. For they're questioning the whole notion that the sexologists first invented and that still brings people together on marches like this one. The notion that you can group together people who prefer their own sex and label them as a breed apart, a breed called homosexuals. Galeb itself has already exposed the flaws in this way of thinking, they say. The movement brought out middle-aged men who'd been married and had children. Were they straight or were they gay? Did it make sense to divide the two? We've all become obsessed with, with sharp definitions of what people are. We begin to define people around their sexual activity. We begin to define people as normal or abnormal around their sexual activity. I think lots of people are finding that this, these rigid definitions don't actually correspond to the range of, of desires, of wishes, of needs that they actually have. The movement also brought out such a range of men with such varied personalities, backgrounds and interests that many argue it makes no more sense to group them together by their sexual preferences than by their height or by the colour of their eyes. And so they would argue that we should return to thinking the way that people used to do, of homosexual acts rather than of homosexual people. So what's increasingly coming out of the gay movement, I think, is, is the notion that, yes, it's important to assert the gay identity as a positive act, but what we have to do as well is affirm, affirm the importance of homosexuality as a set of sexual practices. Something, in other words, that's potential in people who don't necessarily define themselves as gay. What I'm suggesting 
is that we're moving to a situation where there's a much wider spectrum of choice, where there's a sort of pluralism of possibilities of choice, where it'll be possible to live out a set of experiences without having to fit into these rigid definitions as they've existed for a hundred years.